When I was growing up, I used to love watching the Indiana Jones movies. Now, if you're familiar with those movies, you might remember a particular scene where Indiana Jones is being chased by a giant boulder. For many of us, that boulder is data. Every day, we are inundated with more data than our brains could possibly process. And just like that boulder, it feels like the data is coming right at us and we can't get out of the way. But if we know how, we can use that same data to help us make better decisions about our health, wealth, and happiness. The best part about Indiana Jones was that he always had with him a simple toolkit to deal with whatever situation might come his way. So I'd like to tell you about a few simple techniques that you can use to navigate data more effectively and to ensure that you don't get crushed by that data boulder headed your way. So let's take a look at the first tool, definition. A certain cereal brand used to claim that every box of its cereal contained two scoops of raisins. That sounds pretty reasonable, right? But wait a second, how big is a scoop? Is it a tiny scoop that only contains 10 raisins? Or is it a huge scoop that contains hundreds of raisins? We see these types of unclear data definitions all the time, from guidelines like drink eight glasses of water a day, to more complicated topics, including in politics. Recently, in the United States, there's been a lot of talk about creating tax cuts for the middle class. But who exactly is the middle class, and what are the qualifications? Do we all agree on the same ones? Does where you live or whether or not you have a family make a difference? If you earn $40,000 a year and you live in a rural area as a single person, are you part of the middle class? What if you earn $100,000 a year, but you're a family of four living in New York City? Are you part of the middle class? So when it comes to data, it's not just about size or about income, because there's another area that's equally important, and that's the time period. A few months ago, I was in Silicon Valley meeting with a number of startups, and during one of the meetings, someone stood up and proudly proclaimed, we are the fastest growing startup in Silicon Valley. Pretty amazing, right? So you know me well enough by now to know that I can't just let that one go. How do you define a startup? And how do you define growth in this situation? Is it based on the number of customers or users, the company's revenues, the number of associates that they have, or some other metric altogether? So these all illustrate the first issue that we face when it comes to data, and that's a lack of clarity. And we defeat this using our Indiana Jones tool of definition by asking some questions to understand what exactly is the data and what time period are we looking at. Now, to understand our next tool, let's go back to that fastest growing startup in Silicon Valley and to one word specifically, fastest. Fastest, but compared to what? Now, there's a number of words that, whenever you hear them, I want you to think of them as trigger words that make you immediately skeptical of whatever information follows. Words like the best, the most, the largest, the fastest. These are all words that imply comparison. But oftentimes, data is presented without context and without comparison. How many times have you seen, or how many times have you written on a slide, our sales grew 12%? But you don't know yet if that number is good or if it's bad, if it's really impressive or if it was a disaster, because you haven't compared it to anything. You haven't benchmarked it yet against other relevant information to understand the context. Advertising is really great at making numbers feel authoritative without much context. In 2007, a famous toothpaste brand declared that 80% of dentists recommended their toothpaste. So the conclusion that you might come to when you hear something like that is that only 20% of dentists had recommended another toothpaste brand, right? But actually, that wasn't the case, because in this scenario, while those 80% of dentists did recommend this particular toothpaste brand, at the same time, they had also recommended other toothpaste brands as well. So how do we fall into these types of data traps, and then how do we get ourselves back out? Well, the first issue is that oftentimes the data, even without context, even without a benchmark, somehow sounds okay at face value, like that 12% growth. 
But the other issue is also about the authoritative nature of data, especially when it's coupled with expertise. If a dentist or if a doctor or if some other assumed professional or expert tells us something, we're inclined to believe that unless we happen to be an expert in that same area and know something to refute it. But we have the perfect tool in our Indiana Jones toolkit to get out of this one, and it's called awareness and doubt. By making ourselves aware of the context and benchmarking the data against other relevant pieces of information and doubting the source and doubting its authoritative nature, we can start to have a much clearer picture about the data itself. But there's still one more data trap that you might find yourself in. And I like to call it solving the problem of averages. You see, data is often presented at the wrong level of detail. It's often presented in aggregate or at an average. Let me give you an example. In 2017, the fertility rate in the United States, as measured by the number of children born per woman during her lifetime, was 1.87. Now, immediately when we see a number like this, we know that no one is having exactly 1.87 children, right? That would be pretty crazy. We know intuitively that what this number really means is that many women are having two children. Some are having zero or one, and of course, some others are having more than two. But this type of intuition about data isn't always so obvious. Think for a minute about your investments or your retirement portfolio. A friend of mine was recently telling me about a great new place that he'd found to invest his money. He said that when he checked at the end of last year, he'd made a 7% return on his investment, and he was pretty happy about that. But we couldn't let it go at just that, so we had to de-average or break that number down further to see what was going on. You see, while overall he had made a 7% return on his investment, each different product in his portfolio was growing at a different rate. His stocks had performed really well. They were up 10%. His bonds, a little bit below average at 4%, and his cash investments barely grew at all, only 1%. So if my friend hadn't done a double-click and looked into that next level of data, breaking it down and looking at the individual segments, he never would have known how his overall portfolio was performing just by looking at that 7%. And next year, when he decides how to invest his money, he might make some different decisions. So, in the end, we're going to continue to be absolutely inundated with that data, coming at us with vagueness and imprecision, a lack of context and an air of authority, and also being presented to us at the wrong level of detail. But now, just like Indiana Jones, we have this simple toolkit of a few simple tools to take care of that. By using the first tool of definition to clearly define the data that we're talking about, as well as the time period, by using the second tool of awareness and doubt to be aware of the context, benchmark that data against other relevant pieces of information, and understand more about the data source itself, and using that third tool to help us solve the problem of averages and break down that data into smaller segments to understand what makes up the larger whole, we can have a much more insightful view of how that data looks like. Thank you.